Woodland Hills? Hope you are all in the holiday spirit. Are you in the holiday spirit? You strike me as kind of Scrooges sometimes. Are you in the holiday spirit? Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Bah, humbug. Well, I hope that you are in the Christmas spirit of things. I, sometimes Christmas is hard for people. I, I get that. Uh, you know, you get this model of the perfect family sitting around the Christmas tree with a fire and Maybe your family background or your family right now isn't quite like that, uh, and it can be kind of tough. So I just pray God's comfort on you, and uh, sometimes Christmas is something you have to just persevere through. Uh, but if possible, I hope that it's a time of joy as you focus your attention on uh, what it really is about, the incarnation. So we are right now doing this series. Uh, we're calling it BC because we're looking at uh, Christmas before Christ. We're looking at the prequel to Christmas. To understand any person, uh, you have to know something about their past what leads up to their present situation, who they are in the present. And the same thing is true of Jesus and, and the incarnation. Incarnation is just a fancy word for the truth that God became a human being. Uh, we're looking at the prequel, all the stuff in the Old Testament that leads up to it. And we saw last week, uh, we looked at the master plan. And uh, I shared my own conviction that the incarnation uh, wasn't uh, initially a rescue mission. It was the plan from the start became a rescue mission after the fall and our captivity, uh, but it, it was uh, God's plan from the start to pour himself into us so that we could be poured into him and there'd be this beautiful union. What I, I want to do this morning is look at the, the, the bloodline leading up to Jesus. We're going to be looking at the genealogy of Matthew, and we're entitling this message, Bad Blood, uh, because we'll see that in the background of Jesus, the bloodline leading up to, to his birth, uh, there's some pretty shady things that go on. I should say that this message will be rated PG-13. Uh, I'm just preaching the Bible, folks, uh, but I will use the word sex. Uh, some people object to that. They say, well, use a euphemism like sleeping together or making love. But there's no sleeping or love involved in these. <laughs> so you, we got to call it what it is. So there, there you go. So PG-13, probably something like that. But I'll, I'll be as, you know me, I'm, I'm a discreet, self-censoring kind of... You have no idea how much I censor. All right. So I'll, maybe this is why, that's, why I have that tendency. Um, I, I've shared this before, but the, my last name's Boyd, and uh, our, our name comes from the island of Butte uh, in Scotland. And Boyd's a derivative of Butte. Isn't that interesting? Um, and it turns out in the Middle Ages, I read this, uh, someone who had no life wrote a book on the bo history of the Boyds. So um, I, I read a little section of that. And um, it turns out we were, we were uh, in the Middle Ages, nobility. Yes, right up there. We were the keepers of the palace, they called us. Uh, and that's sort of second down uh, from the feudal lord. And so we, we, were, we, were, we were on the inner circle. We were those magnificent knights, captains of the knights, and all of that. And then one of my idiot ancestors of unsurpassable worth uh, got an idea of kidnapping the feudal lord's daughter and holding her for ransom. And others in the Boyd clan helped out with that. Uh, the feudal lord refused to pay the ransom. Instead, he called all of his feudal lord buddies all over Scotland and Ireland and Europe. And they came over here and basically almost extinguished the Boyds, uh, ran us out of Scotland. And for the next four or five centuries, our name was synonymous with scandal and scoundrels. We were lowlifes, kind of still are. In fact, we did some other lowlife things along the way. And it just, you know, it gets me to thinking that if, if it wasn't for that idiot ancestor, I would have been somebody. I could have been a contender. I could have been a player. I, I could have been born in one of those castles over there in Scotland. I mean, that would have been me, man. That would have been my house right there. It wouldn't be called Downton Abbey. It would be called Boyd Abbey. There you go. We, we could have been somebody. But see, it just goes to show that who you are in the present is affected by uh, who people were in the past, the bloodline leading up to you. Uh, now, you're still free, you're not determined, uh, you know, so it's, it's, you're not fated, but the circumstances of your life uh, affect who you are in the present. And we all kind of intuit this on some level, that, you know, no one's an island, uh, our past is part of us, for better or for worse. I mean, imagine if you were the granddaughter of Adolf Hitler, for example. Uh, that would mean something, wouldn't it? Um, and people might look at you and wonder, you know, do you have some of that bad blood in you? On the other hand, if you're the son or daughter of Bono, of you too, that'd probably be a positive thing. Or, or at least if you're a Rockefeller or a Kennedy, uh, in some circles that would be a positive thing. Uh, you, know, you just have an ability to make money, apparently. Uh, our, as individualistic as our culture is, and we have the most individualistic worldview of anyone in history, 
uh, individuals stand alone for us, but even we intuit that our past is still connected to us. We're in some sense identified with it. Now, in the ancient world and in, in most cultures, still to this day, they have that intuition much stronger than that. Uh, in the ancient Jewish world, the individual was simply the tip of an iceberg, and the iceberg was the whole family line. Uh, you are identified with your past. So they really understood that to know the individual, you need to know, you know who they come from. That's why we find all these genealogies in the Old Testament. Um, you know, we, we, we come across those things, I don't know about you, but they're pretty boring. You know, so-and-so we got, so-and-so we got, so-and-so we got, so-and-so we got, so-and-so come on, get on with it. And unless I'm studying it for some reason, I pretty much ignore it. Um, it's boring to us, but it wasn't to ancient people. This was the exciting stuff. Because this is what told you about the person. Uh, who, 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 what is their bloodline? That, that, that says a lot about them in the present. Now, the whole purpose of genealogies wasn't to give just factual information. It was to highlight the bloodline. So they would include the important people. Often they'd exclude the unimportant people. Uh, and so you can't, like, date things based on those genealogies. When they say son of or begat, they just mean descendant of. In fact, Matthew starts off his genealogy uh, in verse 1 by saying, Jesus, the son of David, who was the son of Abraham. Well, he skipped a couple generations there, didn't he? Now, he goes in to fill them out, but um, he didn't need to. I mean, some, sometimes you have things said like that, and they just drop out a lot. Even when he fleshes it out, he, he skips a couple generations. To ancient people, that was no big deal. The purpose was to put the, say, who's noteworthy in your past? Who are your important ancestors? Now, what's interesting, I'm gonna look, we're going to look at Matthew's genealogy. What's really interesting is who Matthew thinks is noteworthy. In particular, we're going to look at five women that are in Matthew's genealogy. Now, that itself is noteworthy because um, in ancient genealogies, they didn't include women. I mean, they, they believed the bloodline only came through men. This is a sexist, patriarchal worldview. Uh, they thought the woman was just the receptacle Contributed nothing really to, it's, and that, that seems stupid too, because what with the child, doesn't the child somewhat look like the mother? They, but anyways, this just shows you how strong the sexism was. So they excluded women from genealogies altogether, but we find five of them in Matthew. And he'd have no reason to put those in there unless he's, he's making a point. In fact, these five women all have some scandals surrounding them. And that says something as well. And so I'm going to, since we do find genealogies boring, I'm not going to read the whole thing here this morning. I'm going to read part of the genealogy that mentions these five women. I'll tell a little bit about their stories. And this is tabloid stuff. I mean, this is why it's PG-13. And then uh, we'll draw several points out of it at the end of this message. So here's what we find in Matthew. Uh, he starts, well, he doesn't start, but we start, uh, where he says, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. That's the first lady. And then we find Selman, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. That's the second woman. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David, and David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. That's the fourth woman. And then, skipping down to verse 16, we find that Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary, of course, was the mother of Jesus, who was called Messiah. Pray with me here for a moment. Father, I uh, pray that this stuff, which often can seem so boring to us, that would take on life here this morning and instruct us and do its work in us. Let your word go forth and not return void. For everybody in this auditorium or listening through podcasts, I pray, Lord, that you'd open our hearts and minds to receive your word, not just on an information level, but on a heart level that would make a difference in how we view ourselves, understand Jesus, view the world, view other people, Build your kingdom in our hearts and minds through this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to talk about Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. First of all, Tamar. Now, to, to understand Tamar, I have to start with Judah. Judah is a very important person in the Old Testament. There was that famous prophecy that the Messiah would be a lion that comes out of the tribe of Judah. So he, This is a, a big figure here. Um. So Judah, uh, he, he's one of the 12 sons of, of uh, Jacob, and at some point he leaves the family and goes to Canaan. We're not told why. He just goes to Canaan. There he marries uh, a lady and has three sons, and then the lady dies. Uh, the three sons, the, the firstborn is a guy named Ur, E-R. They had weird names back then. We didn't get smart about names until about this century. Uh, but he was named Ur. Hey, Ur, come here. And um, uh, so he, he marries Tamar. 
a Canaanite woman. Now, he dies before they can have any children. Uh, and so now the second born, a guy named Onan, he marries Tamar. He has to by law. Uh, in those days, marriages weren't for the sake of love. They were for the purpose of procreation, to pass on the bloodline, to have children. Um, and so the older brother was supposed to take responsibility of that to make sure that the bloodline continues on. Unfortunately, he dies before they have children, partly because he didn't want to have children with Tamar, and that's a whole different story that we can't get into. So now uh, it should be the thirdborn's chance to marry Tamar. He's a guy named Sheila. And um, uh, unfortunately, he's too young to get married. But also, Judah really doesn't want him marrying Tamar. Um, Read between the lines a little bit in the, in the narrative in, in Genesis 38. And it seems that Judah thought this woman was cursed. And everyone who marries her is uh, going to die. He probably also thought she was infertile because she hasn't had a, born a child yet. So this, Sheila is his last chance to pass on the bloodline. And he doesn't want to waste it on Tamar. So now Tamar is in a desperate situation. She is without a husband and without a son. And um, really without a tribe now because uh, she married into uh, Judah's tribe. And that is a desperate situation for women in the ancient world. If you were, didn't have some means of support, this is a sexist, patriarchal world where men have all the cards, everything stacked against the women. They're at the mercy of men. And if you don't have a uh, husband and or son to take care of you, uh, you're, you're pretty much on your own. It means you're going to either have to be a prostitute or you're going to have to be a beggar. Um, the other thing is that that law that required the second and third born to marry the woman was also for the woman's sake in case she was a foreigner in the tribe because their, their, their connection to the tribe was by having a husband or by having a child of the tribe. And if you don't have either, you're really not part of the tribe. So you're on your own, alone in the world. And not only does that put you in a desperate situation, but it's very dangerous. These women were sometimes just abducted and sold into slavery. Uh, they were raped. It was just a terrible, terrible spot to be in. So here's Tamar in this desperate situation, but she comes up with a plan. Now, the, the first three women I'm going to talk about, uh, they're sometimes spoken of as, as though they were involved in a sex scandal, but it really isn't about sex. Um, what's going on here is these, these are desperate women in desperate situations, and they're using the only resource available to them, which is their womanhood, to survive. These are ingenious survival stories. So here's Tamar's survival story. She has a plan. Every year there was a big festival, a livestock festival, where all the herdsmen would come together. And that's where they would uh, you know, trade goats and cows and sheep and sell their fleece and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so she knows that Judah's going to be going to this livestock festival. Um, so she takes off her widow's garment and puts on a veil over her face to conceal her identity. And then she goes and sits herself at the gate of the city where they're having this festival so she can see everybody who comes in, and everybody who comes in can see her. And then we read this. Judah sees this woman with a veil. He saw her, and she, he assumed that she was a prostitute since she had a veil over her face. Apparently prostitutes dressed a little bit differently back then than they do today. And Judah has been without a wife for some time now, so he apparently was feeling a little frisky, so he wanted to go over and make a deal. He left the road and went over to her. This doesn't shed very good light on Judah, does it? And he said, let me sleep with you. I want to have sex. No small talk or anything, just boom, there it is. He had no idea that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, well, what will you pay me? I'll send you a kid goat from the flock, he said. That's how they did business back then. Hey, baby, I got a goat. You want to tango? All right. So he's going to have to go back and get the goat. Okay, but he doesn't want to wait till he gets the goat to do the deal. He wants to seal this deal now. Um, and so she says, well, I'm not going to let you do that unless you give me a pledge until you send it. Okay, we're going to have sex now, but then I want a pledge. Kind of a security deposit here. And he says, so what would you want in the way of a pledge? And she said, your personal seal and cord and the staff you carry. Now, this was your uh, identification in the ancient world. Uh, this seal was what you would put on uh, letters, for example, when you sent them to somebody to, to let them know this was yours. It was one of a kind. It was your personal, it was like, it was like your driver's license or ATM card or something like this. And they would, they would uh, carry it a cord around their neck, so they would always have it there. The staff would also have the signature of the family on it. Uh, it would show that he was the head, head tribesman uh, or herdsman of, of this tribe. So this is Jacob's personal identification. So he handed them over to her and slept with her, and she got pregnant. Okay, so here's how this thing goes down. Uh, he goes and gets the goat, comes back, but Tamar, who he thinks was just an everyday prostitute, she's gone. 
And so uh, he, looked, he sends our guys to look for her, can't find her anywhere. So three months later, he finds out that his daughter-in-law is uh, pregnant, three months pregnant, and he's outraged. Just, this brings shame on the family, uh, you know, and this is, this is serious stuff in the ancient world. Um, and there's law that said that you could be put to death for this, and that's what Judah calls for. In fact, he calls for her to be burned alive at the stake. He's livid. And it turns out she is fertile, but not with uh, his, his bloodline. So, you know, for him, this is, this is outrage. So he calls for her to be burned at the stake. He summons uh, Tamar. Tamar shows up, and she's got the personal cord and seal and staff. And she says, well, if you're going to kill me, kill the guy who did this terrible thing to me. Uh, here's his, his cord and staff and, and, and uh, seal. And, and so find him, and uh, you'll have your, your culprit. And she does this publicly, and Judah is so busted. <laughs> Everybody knows what the story is. Okay, so, so as a result of this, he never marries Tamar, but he takes Tamar and the two children under their, uh, his wing. She has, she has twins, and so they now live in the household of Judah, and um, she survives, and uh, uh, the family goes on. She, one of her sons is named Perez, and it's through Perez that the Messianic line comes. So now we have in the bloodline of Jesus a guy who slept with a prostitute, or he thought was a prostitute, and a daughter-in-law who pretended to be the prostitute to get the father-in-law to sleep with her to pass on the line. And if it wasn't for that shady plan that she had to survive, we wouldn't be hearing about the Messiah being a lion who comes from the tribe of Judah. And if our past is part of our present, as they saw it in the ancient world, if our bloodline is part of who we are, well, this isn't looking really good for Jesus right now, is it? Uh, that's pretty shady stuff. Then we come to uh, Rahab. She is an interesting lady. Uh, she is a Canaanite as well. And, uh, and notice Perez would be half Canaanite, half Jewish, half Canaanite. And that's who the bloodline comes through. So then we come to Rahab. And she is a uh, Canaanite living in Jericho at the time when the Israelites are, are sieging the city. Uh, she is a prostitute. And as I said before, you're only a prostitute in the ancient world, and pretty much today as well, if you're in a desperate situation. Guys like to think that they, they're prostitutes because they like sex so much. Well, that's just a fantasy in guys' heads. Uh, no, th 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 this is a desperate thing. We don't know the background here, but this is where we find Rahab. Now, uh, Joshua had sent in some spies to find out kind of what kind of forces the, the city had that might fight against them. And these spies get trapped behind the walls of the city. And they end up hiding in the uh, room of, of Rahab. Or at least they said they were hiding, maybe they were lying and doing other things, taking a break from their spy duties, we don't know. But um, there they are in the, the room of this prostitute. Rahab has the good sense to know that things, she reads the writing on the wall, this city is going to go down. And so she makes a deal with these two spies. And the deal is, I'll tell you what, I will you know, hide you and I'll lie to the guards and I'll sneak you through the city walls if you'll take me and my parents and my siblings with, with you because we know that your God's bigger than our God's. And so they agree to that deal. And this is how Rahab ends up joining the tribe of the Israelites. Uh, as she's part of this tribe, she ends up marrying a guy named Selman. Selman and they uh, give birth to a son named Boaz, and that's where the Messianic line is going to come now, through that. So now what Jesus has in his uh, bloodline, uh, he's got a, a prostitute who's really good at lying, uh, who is... Um, a member of the chief enemy of Israel. And not only that, but there was at this time a law, it's found in Deuteronomy, that prohibited Jews from marrying Canaanites. So they broke a law to get married. So we got a prostitute who's good at lying and who broke a law to marry this Jewish guy, and that's the messianic line that uh, Jesus is born into. And if our past is part of our present, if we identify with, with the bloodline, well then this is not looking very good for, for, for Jesus. And that brings us to the third woman here. And this one, I, I just love Ruth. Read that a book again this week, and it just touches me. Um, Ruth was a Moabite lady who married a Jewish guy. Uh, but the, uh, the guy died before they could have children. So Ruth finds herself in a desperate situation. She's a Moabite among Israelites. In fact, the Israelites were, were very hostile towards her. She was not liked there. Uh, but she's in this desperate situation, without a husband, without a son. Her mother-in-law, a lady named Naomi, is in the same situation. Uh, she had two sons, and they both died, and her husband died. So these two women are both in this desperate situation. So they cling to one another. They become very, very good friends. 
And then if just being in that situation wasn't bad enough, a famine hit the land. And now they're close to starvation. And this is where Naomi at one point says to, to Ruth, go back to your people. Go back to Moab. Uh, the famine isn't as bad over there, and you'll be among your people, not among these folks who are prejudiced against you. Uh, but this is where Ruth gives her famous speech where she says, you know, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay, and where you die, I will die. She's not going to leave her. And, and see, what's going on there is Naomi is much older than Ruth. Ruth is still quite young, and she knows if she leaves Naomi, Naomi's probably going to die. And she's saying, I'm going to stick by you and take care of you. It's a touching uh, story. Well, then, the way they survive is Ruth would, by, from morning to night, she'd go into this field, a wheat field, and she'd follow the harvesters, and she'd pick up the scraps, whatever they would, would, would miss or drop. Um, she, she would pick that up, and that's, that's how her and Naomi would survive, on the scraps. Morning to night, she did this. The field was owned by the son of Rahab and Selman, Boaz. And Boaz had, at this point, become very wealthy. He owned a couple of these fields, so he was doing very well, despite the fact that there's a famine in the land. He's a wealthy guy. He's much older than, than, than Ruth, and he's a distant relative of Naomi. Now, he hears about Naomi's loyalty, or Ruth's loyalty to Naomi, and he's very impressed by that. Uh, he's also impressed by how diligently she works. She's right there in the morning when they start harvesting, and she stays till they're done. So that, that impresses him. And if you read behind, between the lines just a little bit, uh, you, you get the impression that Ruth was also kind of hot. Uh, and so Boaz took an interest in her. But it wasn't a romantic interest, interest it really. He was just kind to her. In fact, at one point, it's so touching. At one point, uh, he invites her to stay, and, and at the end of their harvesting, they'd have a supper together, uh, all the hired hands. And so he invites her to eat with the hired hands. And it, it's so touching because the, the, the narrative says, and Ruth was able to eat as much as she wanted. And could even take some uh, uh, leftovers home for Naomi. And I just get the picture of this, this young peasant girl, so tired and so hungry. And she's been working for 12, 14 hours, however long. And now she has this it's Christmas for her because there's all this food and she can eat whatever she wants. She probably had, hasn't had a meal like this for, for over a year. And I just see her gorging her face like she's so excited that she's eating all this food. Uh, it's just kind of touching. Well, Naomi notices that Boaz is kind of getting eyes uh, to, for Ruth. Uh, and, and she sees this might be the ticket. This is that ingenuity I'm talking about. How, how to survive in a world where all the cards are stacked against you. Men have, have all the power. How do you survive in this situation? So she comes up with a plan. Now, it's got to be a good plan because there's a lot of things stacked against this relationship ever happening. For one thing, Boaz is half Jewish, and he's bought into the, the, the tribe of the Israelites. So the law is applied to them, and there's a law in Deuteronomy that forbids Jews to marry Moabites, just as there was a law pre 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 preventing them from marrying Canaanites. Uh, so there's a law here, a sacred law. On top of that, Boaz is more than twice her age, and that wasn't that big of an obstacle in the ancient world, but it was a little bit of an obstacle. But a bigger obstacle would have been the fact that he's very, very wealthy, and Ruth is a beggar. Uh, and you don't marry down, certainly not down this drastically in, in that world. You usually marry to try to marry up or at least, you know, to expand your territory. So there's a lot going against her. But here's the plan. And I just love it. It's found in, in uh, Ruth chapter 3. She goes, Ruth, first of all, wash up. <laughs> Take that. Take your annual bath. You know, the peasants didn't do that much, all right? Get nice. And then put on some perfume. <laughs> uh, you know, the peasants don't, don't use perfume very often. Put on some nice perfume and then get your best dress. We don't want you looking like a peasant girl. You, in other words, deck yourself out. Put on display your hotness. And then go to the house of Boaz. And don't, don't knock on the door or anything. Just spy him out. <laughs> Basically stalk him. And when you are, are you know, peering through the window and you see he's had a full meal and he's had a lot of wine and he's feeling really in a good mood, he's tipsy, well, even then don't go in. Wait until he lies down and starts to doze off. And then sneak into his bedroom and uh, in those days, they wore these long garments when they slept, kind of their blanket. And she, says, she said, lift up the garment over his feet so his feet get cold. And then you just go and cuddle yourself around those feet. <laughs> I know it sounds like behavior of a, of a puppy, you know, but, but <laughs> these are desperate women in a sexist culture, and they're going to use whatever they got to, you know, make it work. Well, Boaz uh, uh, wakes up. And is pretty surprised to find this peasant young lady at his feet. Now, he, this looks really scandalous, doesn't it? A young girl climbing into bed with an older guy. He could have called the guards to save his reputation, had her arrested or something. This, there's a risk involved in this plan, but he doesn't do that. And Ruth pours on the charm. Oh, she just, she, she just pours on the charm. 
Uh, and then finally, at the end of the charming conversation, she says, <laughs> I love this, uh, would you mind sharing part of your garment with me, uh, just a corner, because uh, I'm cold. Uh, and so he, now she is going to be tucked under his garment. That's what he wears to bed, and she's coming under that. No, nothing inappropriate happens so far as we know, uh, but it looks scandalous. And in fact, the text says that uh, Naomi, or Ruth had to sneak out in the morning. He said, go out the, out the back door very quietly so no one would, would see this going on here. Well, you know, the plan works. The plan works. After that encounter, this young, beautiful, uh, nice-smelling lady crawling into bed with him, keeping each other warm, uh, he's hooked, he's hooked, and he ends up marrying Ruth. And they together have a child named, named Obed, and that's the one through whom the Messianic bloodline comes. Now, notice this about Obed. Since his mother was a full... Moabite, and the father was uh, half Canaanite and half Jewish, this guy's only going to be a quarter Jewish. And that's the one through whom the Messianic line comes. So many people get this impression that the bloodline leading up to Jesus was Jewish, Jewish, Jewish all the way, but that is so not the case. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, uh, being mixed together there, which is maybe part of the point. So uh, the bloodline is going to come through, through, through Obed. So now Jesus has in his past, and your past is part of who you are, he has a, a young peasant Moabite lady who who basically stalked, decked herself out, stalked this guy, and crawled into bed with this much older gentleman to get him to marry her. If our past is part of our present, well, this is looking kind of questionable for Jesus, isn't it? Then we come to our fourth lady, the famous Bathsheba. And if Ruth was hot, Bathsheba, well, she knocked it out of the park. Because here's the deal. One day David's walking around on, on his palace roof and just kind of sightseeing. <laughs> And uh, he sees a sight. Uh, he sees this Bathsheba on the top of her roof uh, in the nearby neighborhood taking uh, a bath on the top of the roof, naked. Uh, David, he's already got a thousand wives and some concubines. How he has the energy for this, I don't know. But he, 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 he's already got all these women, but he, now he wants that one. She's married to a guy named Uriah. That's why she's referred to in the text, not, not by name, but the one who used to be married to Uriah. Matthew's reminding us of this, 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 this episode. And Uriah is this loyal, faithful guy who's the head of David's army, and they're out fighting the Philistines. They have been for a number of months. He's leading the attack on the Philistines. So Bathsheba is on her own. So David then sends his guards over there and says, fetch her to my palace. And Bathsheba really doesn't have any say in this matter. You don't disagree with the king. And so um, they have a relationship. Relationship. They slept together. No, there wasn't any sleeping. Uh, it wasn't love. It was sex. And she ends up getting pregnant. Now, this is really bad. This is nasty stuff. Not good for a king to uh, be getting another guy's wife pregnant. And so he tries to cover it up. First, he, he, he calls Uriah back from the battle. He says, Uriah, you've been working so hard and so faithful. Take a night off. Come in and enjoy your wife. Like I did. Um, <laughs> he doesn't say that. But, see, he wants it to look like it's his kid, obviously, Uriah's kid. Now, the next morning... He comes, he talks to Uriah and says, well, how'd it go? And Uriah says, well, thank you for this you know, furlough that you gave me, but I, I could not have sex with my wife um, because it's just not fair to my soldiers who are out there giving their life for our land, and, and, and they're dying, and it's not right that I should enjoy the pleasures of a woman. David, I'm sure, was thinking, you idiot! <laughs> also, this guy should be canonized. I mean, he's already been away for a couple of months, and he comes back, and I mean, his willpower alone should get him canonized as a saint. But uh, uh, that, that plan didn't work. And so he has to come up with another plan, and this plan involves him killing Uriah by having him lead a charge against the Philistines and um, uh, then having the, uh, he told another captain to pull the guard back, uh, leaving Uriah alone so he would be killed. It would look like a casualty of war, but everybody knows this was David's way of getting him killed. And then he quickly marries Bathsheba to make the child look like the child's legitimate. So now Jesus has, in his wonderful ancestry, you would think the Son of God would come into the world with a holy bloodline, a noble bloodline, a righteous bloodline, but instead, now he's got a guy, a king, who's a murderous, adulterous, lying guy. And he marries the mother only to cover up uh, the, the wrongdoing there. Not looking really good. This is some bad blood that's going into Jesus here. And not looking really good. And then finally, we, we have Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, her and Joseph don't do anything wrong, um, but it looks like they do. Mary gets pregnant, and they're not, they're betrothed, which is a kind of legal marriage, but you don't have relationships to the wedding, and you get officially married, and so she gets pregnant, and, and we know that this was a child conceived by the Holy Spirit, but, but 
No one else is going to believe that. In fact, even Joseph didn't believe it initially. Yeah, right. The Holy Spirit came upon you. I don't know any guys named the Holy Spirit. So um, uh, you know, this, he, then the angel has to warn him in a dream that you know, this, Mary's telling the truth. And that's the only way this goes forward. But what it means then is that Mary, all of her life, is going to have a reputation. And in the ancient Jewish world, this is huge, of being a loose woman. Something she could have got killed for. And it means that Jesus is going to go all of his life having a reputation of being a bastard child. Illegitimate. Uh, and we, we know that it, from the Gospels, the Pharisees at one point, when he's debating them, they at one point say, at least we know who our father is. And they're kind of digging at him. Uh, so this is the reputation. And God did this on purpose. Now think about this. And here's, here's the first point to draw out of this stuff. We don't get to choose our bloodline. It's just, you know, we're born into it. But God can choose his. And God did this on purpose. I think this is the point that Matthew's making by having these people included in the genealogy. God, on purpose, chose this bloodline. Could have gone with a more righteous one. I'm sure none are perfect, but certainly there's some that are more righteous and holy and godly than this. But God purposely chooses this identity because your bloodline's part of your identity. This is who you are. And what it tells us is God identifies with sinners. It wasn't just on the cross that God started being one who identifies with sinners. He's always been one who identifies with sinners. He says, you are my family. You are my blood. This is who God chooses. He chooses on purpose to have a bloodline that involves a Canaanite lady who is going to uh, trick her father-in-law into having sex with her and a father-in-law who has sex with prostitutes. Um, it's going to include in the bloodline uh, a, a, a lady, young lady who's going to crawl in the bed with a much older man to try to get him to marry her. It's going to involve a prostitute, a Canaanite prostitute, who's really good at lying and a member of the prime enemy of Israel. It's going to involve a king who's murderous and adulterous, and now it's going to involve a mother who all of her life is going to have a reputation of being loose. It's going to involve God, going, Jesus being God and man, uh, going all of his life having the reputation of being an illegitimate kid. God does this on purpose. He, and he's saying, identify with the sinners. And this is what Jesus teaches. He says, I didn't come into this world to save the righteous as if there were any. I didn't come into this world to save those who think they are righteous. I came into this world to save sinners. Those who know that they're sinners. Those who know that they're, they're on the outside. Those who know that they've got nothing to stand on their own. Who have given up trying to uh, earn their way to heaven and impress God and impress other people and, and put on display their religiosity. Jesus comes for those who know that they are in desperate need of a Savior because he is the Savior of the world. He identifies with sinners. And so I can tell you here this morning, and all who are listening through podcasts, that whatever you've done, so many people think of that they're just too messed up or too screwed up or too sinned up to ever get, you know, be part of the church and be part of the family of God. And I'm here to tell you that that is so, such a lie. The truth is, I don't care what you've done. I don't care how many lies you've, you, you've told. I don't care who you've cheated. I don't care who you've stolen from. I don't care how many people you've slept with. I don't care how many times you've been married, how many affairs you've had. I don't care about any, who you've murdered. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I can tell you with full confidence that you are exactly the kind of person that God wants to call family. You're exactly the kind of blood that Jesus uh, wants to be identified with. That's what the whole genealogy is about. And, and when he comes in, amen. See, here's the thing. When Jesus comes into this bloodline, well, he changes it. He changes it. Out of the scandalous bloodline, the scandalous genealogy, God brought the most beautiful thing in all of history, the person of Jesus Christ. You talk about God bringing good out of evil. This is the, the classic example of it. And this also is part of the reason, I'm sure, why Matthew included these names here. Uh, God dives into the bloodline and changes the bloodline. These folks who were, did scandalous things or had scandals around them, well, they become... They get, they, they get the honor of being the ancestors of Jesus, the Savior of the world. And it sheds a whole new light on them. And so David is, is held up as, as a hero. And Rahab is, is called, is this lying prostitute is called a hero of the faith in Hebrews 11. When Jesus comes into a bloodline, he changes the bad blood into good blood, the sinful blood into holy blood, the lost blood into redeemed blood. Uh, he transforms everything, and he does the same thing in our life. He comes for, for, he identifies with sinners, but he doesn't leave us in that situation. He redeems us. He redeems our past. If we offer up to him all of our shady stuff in the past, in the family past as well, offer it up to him, well, see, he's a master at bringing good out of evil. All, all the stuff in our past shouldn't have happened. All the wrongs that we've done and all of that shouldn't have happened. But once we surrender to him, it just becomes an opportunity for him to bring something beautiful out of it. That's why Paul says in Romans 8 that in all things God's working together for the better for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. He, he, he's, he's in all things, doesn't will those things, but now that they're there, 
Well, it's not a problem for him. He, he, he brings good out of it. In fact, Paul says in Ephesians 1 that in the end, God will have woven everything together in a beautiful harmony under the headship of Jesus Christ. Everything that's happened somehow will be woven together into this beautiful harmony. God's a genius at that. And so our job is to offer this up to him and, and, uh, and to say, take this and make something beautiful out of it. All my mistakes, all my failures, all the wrongs that I've done, all the people I've hurt, take this and make something beautiful out of it, trusting that he will. And see, this is why in the kingdom, folks, there's no room for regret. There, there should never be regret. The stuff you did in the past, perhaps, some of us have, that you can't undo. and You can't fix it. It's just there. And the enemy would love to take that and, and cause you to just live with this stain. Always feeling guilty about that. Always feeling sad about that. Like all the things you shouldn't have done. Now, folks, learn from the past. Don't keep making the same mistakes over. That's only, but that's the only purpose for even thinking about the past. Uh, learn from the past. Let God forgive the past. And now give it to him and move on. He's the God who's looking at the future for you, not the past about you. Leave that past to him. He'll do something beautiful with it. But don't live in regret. There's no room for regret. I just have a sense right now, I just got a little ping here to pause for a second. Someone, someone has got some regret. You're living with this, this shame, this guilt. That is of the devil. And Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that whoever that is, that you'd free them right now. That abortion. Free them from, from the guilt and the shame, the ongoing regret about that. And collapse whatever pictures, whatever stories they're telling themselves about that. That is of the enemy. And help, Lord, help them to surrender that over to you, trusting that you will make something beautiful. Even out of that, you're always conforming us to the image of Christ, using even the negative, nasty stuff in our past to do it. Freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here's another thing that we learned from the genealogies. There's three points. The second point is this. Uh, it says a whole lot that Matthew includes women. That fact alone is huge. Because, as I said before, uh, in the ancient world, women were not included. You don't mention the mother. There's no purpose for mentioning the mother. So if Matthew does this, it's on purpose. He's saying something. Now, here, here's the thing. God always, because he's not a manipulating, controlling God, he takes people and he takes cultures where they're at, as nasty as they may be. He will not lobotomize people or lobotomize an entire culture to make it what he wants. No, he's going to go through, he treats people like people, and so he goes through a process. He enters it where it's at, works with it where it's at, even, even you know, attaining his own reputation as we look back on this. That's why he appears quite differently in the Old Testament than he does in, in, in the New. He's, he's taking on all the sinfulness of this culture in order to push it. He gets his hands dirty to push it in the direction that he wants. He does it slowly. He does it by, by slowly changing hearts. So God enters into this patriarchal sexist culture. And begins to push back on it. And this is what we find in Matthew's genealogy. It's a, it's a pushing back on the culture. Raising the question, how come other genealogies don't have women in them? And what it's telling us is that the Messiah, the Messiah that comes from this bloodline that includes these women, is going to be a Messiah who's about declaring war on the patriarchalism and sexism that has been reigning in the world since the fall. The Messiah is going to be one who tears down walls that oppress women. He's going to be one who, 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 whose, whose uh, movement is going to uh, be pushing back on, in every way, shape, and form, uh, all of the, the structures of society that put women in the desperate situations that we find Tamar and, and find Rahab and, 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 and find Ruth. Desperate situations that are only there because they live in this sexist patriarchal culture. Uh, the kingdom of God movement that we are all a part of if we surrender our life to Christ is, is, is as a centerpiece has got to be that we're a movement that, that says that men and women are made in the image of God and God's will is never to have one half of that oppressed by the other half. The gender oppression, prioritizing one over the other, was never God's will. You know, that's all part of the fall. Now, even in the New Testament, God has to enter into the, where the culture's at. You can't just, you know, declare it overnight. But we can now, based on what the New Testament says about this and what we see in the bloodline of Jesus, well, we're about announcing that, proclaiming that, and doing all we can to empower women to be what God calls them to be. So women, if, if you are called to be a senior pastor, then be a senior pastor. Don't let gender be a factor in this. Uh, and, and if you're called to be a lawyer, be a lawyer. If you're called to be a scholar, be a scholar. If you're called to be a mother and a housewife, then, then praise God, that's a noble thing. But do it because it, you're called to do it, not because society pressures you into that. Be everything God calls you to be. Uh, it still requires, especially in the church, unfortunately, the church is, is the strongest, has the strongest stronghold of patriar patriarchalism still in it, in Western culture anyways. 
And so, yeah, it's an uphill battle, but it's one that's worth fighting. Do not let yourself be slotted into categories uh, based on this fallen world that has always prioritized men over women. The other thing is, is, is just this. The fact that we find in this genealogy people breaking sacred laws to become married to a person of a different ethnicity. We have interracial marriages that were against the law. I mean, this is like, you know, having interracial marriages in the 50s in the South. It's, 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 it's scandalous stuff. Except these laws were right there in the Bible. And the fact that you've got this diversity in the bloodline of the Messiah, it says something significant. This wasn't a pure Jewish bloodline leading up to him. There's a lot of, I only mentioned a few of the things that were diverse here, but there's a lot of diversity in that bloodline. And that itself tells us something, doesn't it? Uh, it tells us that this Messiah, when he comes in this world, uh, part of the fallen structures of this world has been that people divide groups uh, from one another, put walls between one another, and there's hostility between one another. And in the fallen world, we prioritize one over the other and, and privilege one over the other and rank, rank folks on the basis of their ethnicity. But when the Messiah comes in this world, what he's going to be about, and you see this in the ministry of Jesus as well, is declaring war on that, because that was never part of God's will. Uh, it, the, the diversity is God's will. All that magnificent, uh, the beauty of the, the diverse gene pool, that's all part of God's will. But the walls of hostility are not, and those that are becoming coming down wherever the kingdom of God is present, wherever the reign of God is present. It's going to look like people who are doing all they can to end those walls, to end that division, to end the hostility. Paul puts it like this in Galatians 3. He says, in Christ, all of you who are baptized into Christ, if you've, if you've been immersed into Christ, you've clothed yourselves with Christ. As you go down in the water, that's symbolizing the way you're clothed with Christ. See, I'm baptizing the, the floor right here. See, that's, that's good. You know, follow the Holy Spirit. Um, and if you've clothed yourself with Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. <laughs> Look at that. In the first century, Judaism, man, this is, this, you know this is divinely inspired because no first century Jew would ever say this unless they were moved by God to say this. This is not how anyone thinks in the ancient Jewish world. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. There's only one race here, the spiritual descendants of Abraham. And heirs according to the promise. What he's saying there is this. If you're immersed in Christ, then you're clothed with Christ. You wear Christ. Uh, uh, like tomorrow's wearing that veil, you wear Christ. And so what, what we should see in one another is Christ. That we are identity in Christ, who we are in Christ, redeemed in Christ, made holy in Christ. You know, given all of this, the, these promises in Christ. That's what we should see. That's how we relate. And if that's all we see, well, then all the distinctions that the world puts so much emphasis on are rendered null and void. They're insignificant. It just doesn't matter. Amen. Amen. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, insignificant. Male or female, insignificant. Rich or poor, insignificant. It doesn't matter. No, in Christ we are one. And our job, kingdom people, is to manifest that. To do all we can to put that on display. Um, it's not just a truth we're supposed to be happy about. No, we're supposed to live this out. The kingdom is something that's supposed to be lived. Now that is easier said than done. This, this is the tough one. Uh, because the thing is, we all see the world through the eyes of our background and our ethnicity. Uh, we're all enculturated in different ways. Uh, we all have baggage. And it's through that baggage, through that history, through that uh, cultural upbringing that we interpret things. We interpret the world. And different groups, depending on their life experience, interpret things very differently. Um, if we stay locked in our limited myopic ethnic perspective, well then what happens is we simply judge the other perspectives as being wrong. And maybe having bad motives. Oh, they're playing the race card again. Uh, because we're not entering into that, you see. Uh, and, and, and it's especially easy to do if you're privileged in the culture, like white folks are in this culture, where you're not forced to enter into any others, anyone else's perspectives. They can be forced to at least know something about your perspective, but you get to float in a, an arena where you don't have to be, share their perspective. And so it takes intentional effort to enter into that perspective. It usually only happens out of relationship, having relationships with people, credible relationships that look different from you. And as you have a trusting relationship and find out that their experience is very, very different from your own, well, that broadens you some, expands you. I talked to a guy just this week, African-American guy, who just told me when he in North Dakota, pulled over by some policemen, he and his friend were pulled over. Uh, they're both black, and they're driving in this nice Jeep, and that made them suspect, apparently, because they had, the cop pulled them over, and the only reason he gave is you look suspicious. And they had all these bags in the back uh, because they were coming back from a business meeting and they had all this equipment, and that looked suspicious. So the police said, I want to search your car. 
Uh, and th so he got out of the car and said, fine, search it. It's cold outside, uh, but the cops told him he was supposed to stand over by the police car. At one point, this guy puts his hands in his pockets because it's cold. And as he's doing this, now the other friend is helping the policeman unload this stuff. As he does this, the cop reaches for his gun and is just about to pull it out and says, put your hands on the car. And my friend said he thought he was going to get shot that moment. Now, thankfully, he didn't, but he realizes he could have because he was putting his hands in the pocket. Uh, that's an experience I never have had. I have never had anything like that. I wouldn't believe it maybe unless I had a credible relation with somebody who I knew would not make this stuff up. And I know this person. And it's there, you see. And so it expands our, 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 our world so you can begin to understand how other people interpret the world. Right now, folks, man, does the world need the church to model this? Because we've got so much division going on. Yesterday's shooting. This is going to... As violence always does, it just ensures that there's going to be firing back on the other side, and now we're going to have a little war going on in the body of Christ. Our job is to not judge the other perspective, but to learn from it, to be submit, submit to one another. This is the incarnation. This is what God does to us. He dives into our humanity and takes it on himself. Incarnate. And we need to be incarnated into one another across ethnic lines if we're ever going to model the beauty of the oneness that we have in Christ Jesus. The blood of in Jesus, you see, it's not boring at all. It's... it's, it's it's got some shady stuff, some tabloid stuff for sure, but man, it is beautiful because it shows us that we, God identifies with us as sinners. And he does that in order to bring something beautiful and good out of us for all eternity. It shows that God identifies with women and men equally and wants them to be equals in his family. And God identifies with all ethnicities. God created all ethnicities. Jesus died for all ethnicities. And our job is to manifest the beauty of the oneness that we have in Christ. By going out of our way, I encourage folks to go out of the way to build relationships with people who don't look like them, maybe don't talk like them, don't listen to the same kind of music, don't dress like them, but to the, incarnate yourself in the life of another, uh, to learn, to grow, to expand, to model the oneness that we have in Christ. Amen? Amen. Can you stand? I want to ask the prayer team to come up here, and if you have any need whatsoever that could use prayer, I encourage you to come up here and pray with these folks. Don't take that burden out with you. If you want to know how to follow Jesus, you want to start that wonderful journey, come up here and, and share with, uh, that, that interest with these folks, and, and they'll get you started on the kingdom walk. As we leave this place, I pray, Father in heaven, will you, Lord, uh, be expanding us in all ways. Lord God, tear down whatever uh, prejudice we may be having in our own mind towards other ethnicities or prioritizing males over females. And Lord, as we go out of this place, let's do it as freed people who are freed uh, from our sin, knowing that you are one who identifies with us as we are, to transform us into something we could never be on our own. Help us put on display the beauty of your kingdom in every way, shape, and form. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Go out. Love of the world. See you on Christmas Eve. <laughs>